is going on clippers fans welcome to season two episode 49 of clips and dip your favorite maybe clippers podcast i am chuck mockler joined by adam osland and william updike uh we're thanking everyone who's been watching us on youtube over at uh, youtube.com slash at clippers podcast and a big shout out to the new listeners as well the clippers are doing well which means more people are listening to us which is great for us because we love bringing you clippers content we're going to talk the Grammy trip, the game versus the Pels coming up, and then the P.J. Tucker self-induced trade rumors. But first, before we get into all of that, Adam and Will, you guys did a great live this uh, last weekend. Uh, the Clippers are playing great. Adam, how are you feeling on this rainy Los Angeles evening? I feel stupid, guys. I had the Clippers going four and three on the road trip. I was way off. Didn't see him beating Boston. Thought they'd get the split the last two games. And yet, here we are. The Clippers, what, just a half game back of being in first place in the Western Conference. So this team uh, continues to amaze. Yeah, you uh, – yeah, I can't believe I, – I was surprised when you said four and three, if I'm being honest. I thought you were going to be on team five and two. My logic was, you know, I didn't think they'd get the game in Boston, second day of a back-to-back. Uh, and I thought with the injuries, and I thought maybe PG would miss more time, and that somehow would affect things. And it's just a tough road trip. But speaks to how damn good this team is. Six and one, baby. Will, how are you doing? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm doing good. I mean, they exceeded my expectations as well. I think when we were looking at the schedule, that five and two number, I think we all kind of assumed second night in Boston, uh, second night of a back-to-back, -back, that one's probably one you drop. And I think I, I, think I had... I'm pretty sure I had picked the Cavs as maybe their other loss. Because um, they were playing really hot even before the trip started for the Clippers. Yeah. 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 And I think like around that time, they had just started beating good teams as well. They weren't just like slapping up on some like lower level competition. So, um, yeah, they, they exceeded my expectations, man. I'm, I'm doing great. It was pretty crazy. Law Murray had this stat on Twitter. Uh, the Clippers franchise has had 26 road trips of at least seven games. The Grammy trip was the 19th since the arena in downtown was open in 99. They went 6-1, and one, which makes it tied with the early season 2014-2015 trip for the best in franchise history, and it's only the sixth winning Grammy road trip uh, for the Clippers ever, um, which is crazy. And we should give a shout-out to Law Murray, who was at every single one of these games, which is incredible from a reporting standpoint. <laughs> um he yeah. missed the first two, so I'm not going to give him any credit. <laughs> no credit. Um, <laughs> I love Law. He came on with me pregame almost every game on the road trip. He's amazing. He's been crazy. Um, yeah, losing to the Cavs team, it, it makes sense. There's not, like, a whole lot to be mad at here. What, like, I don't know. What was your favorite part of the trip, Adam? It felt like Kawhi kind of cemented his MVP status a little bit more on this yeah. trip. Yeah. People starting to wake up finally. The national media saw that tweet from Adrian Wojnarowski earlier talking about the numbers he's put up. Last 30 games, nobody's ever been that efficient before, baby. 57% from the field, over 50% from three. It is something to behold with uh, just how good Kawhi Leonard has been. But also, you know, they've been winning in a variety of ways, and I don't think they're playing their best basketball. That Defensively, Coach Lou went after them post game. Given up 100 and what 44 points to the Atlanta Hawks. <laughs> yeah. that and was I just garbage. like seeing that. I like seeing the fact that they're demanding perfection. Kawhi, after the win against Detroit, saying we're relying on talent too much. It should be about execution. So they're saying all the right things. Everything uh, with this team is having one eye in the regular season and another on the postseason. What happens in the regular season, what can work during the regular season doesn't necessarily work in the postseason. So you have to get ready for that because the expectations are to win a championship. So men the mentality has just been great. And Coach Lou said before the trip that their goal was to go six and one. He put a number on it, five and two at worst, and they did it. So I couldn't be more proud of this squad and the way they're trending right now. Will, who was your MVP of the trip, do you think? Other than Kawhi? Sure. I mean, obviously, other than the guy who's, you know, the MVP of the league. Uh, Big Zoo for coming back. <laughs> You're giving him brownie points? I didn't expect it. It was unexpected. That's did true. You, I did not expect it. Um, came out of nowhere. Did yeah. you see that from Law Murray as well? He told me this pregame, 
and then he tweeted it out yesterday. But Big Zoo had circled the Miami Heat game because he felt like that's where he could help the team most going up against Bam Adebayo. He wanted to make sure to come back for that game. So he had his own personal goal of when to return, and it's also wrapped up in a team goal. So I just I love that. You're loving the synergy. I love how much you love the synergy of the Clippers right now. Uh, yeah, Zoo, limited minutes in the return, but... I mean, they did need him against Bam Adebayo. I think uh, Lucas Hahn tweeted out the that Harden played, you know, 80 minutes over that last back-to-back -to, -back to close out uh, that road trip. And I knew he'd played a lot of minutes, but just seeing that um, from James Harden with the level of play he was at, average 17, 7, and 9 with the steal and a block. I, I, like that, I mean, other than Kawhi. Almost. Not that many. I'll look. Um, Five, but yeah, <laughs> right. Um, that was a fan. That he was fantastic. I mean, everyone had to be obviously, but he was a really. It was really cool to watch him be great on this road trip. He has the game in Detroit where Will and I were getting inundated on the live with people being alarmist and worried about James Harden and where he's at, even though he just had a triple double right beforehand, or I think it was against the Toronto Raptors, maybe in the opening game of the road trip. But he had just four points against Detroit. Some people were concerned. The next two games, he has three four-point plays, and he leads the league in four-point plays this season by a pretty wide margin over Steph Curry. But that shot that he hit against the Atlanta Hawks, it was the biggest shot of the game. It was insane, just luring in Trey Young to draw that foul, and then the bank was open apparently, or he was calling game, the old Paul Pierce. It, it was incredible. Do you think, because uh, I wonder, it's crazy he has so many more than Steph, considering kind of the frequency this year com compared to Steph. So I wonder, and I tweeted this, how long the NBA, I feel like they're going to figure out a way to outlaw whatever he's doing to get four-point plays. I'm not saying they should, but this feels like something the NBA, uh, as the league, would be upset about. Well, typically well, it's not like a in the out thing or anything anymore, totally. you know, <clears throat> it's not like it, it. It's not like a technicality. I feel like it's just inherent in the way that he creates space um, mm -hmm. that a defender kind of has to reach. Right. It's like, I don't know, like a like an inside low pitch or something like you're going to try to swing at it like you're, That's a you great know, call. it's just it's just what happens. Um, so I feel like, yeah, I feel like that his. While his athleticism is like clearly declined from where it was at his peak in that MVP season, like his IQ is still off the charts. And I think like that's a huge part of that is the way that he knows what a defender is thinking. He know like he knows when he's got you. Um, and I think that that is like, I mean, he sets traps. I'll, I'll say that, but like, I don't Absolutely. mean that in a bad, I don't mean that in yeah. a bad way or a negative way, but like in, from a mental game standpoint, he's setting a trap. And I think that's why he's getting so many of them is, you know, he also knows that this is part of his game that he has to, I don't want to say rely on because he can still get to the rim. I mean, with ease apparently, but uh, it, it is something that, you know, <clears throat> conserves him a little bit in game. I'll say that in game rest, like they always used to say about LeBron. Yeah. The most productive in game rest, the four point play. <laughs> Probably. Um, Adam, you, had, you had something to say? I did want to bring up that, you know, in the postseason, traditionally with James Harden, you're getting less of those calls because they let you play more a more physical brand of basketball for him and Norman Powell. It just can't be a surprise when all of a sudden some of these ticky tack calls on the perimeter. Granted, they're working right now. You got to be aware of that come the postseason where they're just going to let you get away with a little bit more. Uh, Norm, well, we've seen Norm already kind of alter his game, right? Like I, I feel like for – a little while, a period there, he was fishing for contact. And now when he's like looking to finish aggressively, I still think that's a call a call he's getting in the playoffs. Like he's getting clobbered. And he's, yeah, you're right. I feel like you can really tell when Norm's looking for the foul. There's times where you're like, we, we see it as soon as he decided to drive. Um, on this road trip, Norm shot 43% on five and a half three-point attempts mm -hmm. per game, which was fantastic. Um, Isn't that below his season that was average? At, it might be, yeah. Because he's that at like 45% from three. Oh, that, that was, was Adam's, yeah. That, that was Adam's player to close out the trip on the on the back-to-back in the -back and the, and the other game, the last three games. Who could you pick and be wrong about, though, on this road trip, really? Like, so many guys were thriving. Everybody it was Paul. a safe pick. <laughs> Paul George, hey, you know, 17-4-3 and three with two steals. He didn't shoot well, but he was so good. Yes, He was what solid yesterday. Games? What happened to those strings of 20-point games? Come on. I thought we he was more. 
even though they gave up a lot of points and some of that was just really hot shooting and maybe not being good enough early in the first quarter and guys finding a rhythm and then you can't turn it off. But I thought for the most part, the last couple of games, Paul George defensively looked really good and in tune and knowing that he's struggling with his offense, he has to bring more on the other end. And that's part of the value of having James Harden. And having a team this deep where, okay, yeah, I don't have it going right now. How how else can I help the team? Where it's not necessarily a detriment because you don't have that offensive workload on your plate now. Because if James Harden has it going, if Norman Powell has it going, if Amir Coffey has it going, okay, find another way to help this team win. And I think, yeah, that was, I, I think that was like a clear success of this Grammy road trip and why it was better than, than so many of the other ones is like players did have these ebbs and flows, but everyone was able to kind of like fill in in between um, in a way that like, you know, we've seen in fits and bouts throughout the two, one, three era, but never to this level to me. And I mean, it just got me thinking like, you know, we, you know, we went six and one on this stretch, um, you know, a couple of couple less than stellar defensive performances offensively this team is looking unreal um i'm thinking in a seven game series there's no way there's not at least one game where all three of paul Kawhi, and harden hit and if they play defense at the level that we know they can i don't know how you're not running a team out of the gym like seriously i i don't know how you're not just clobbering the team um I, at least in the first couple of rounds i don't know we'll see but you're not with all three capacity. hit the three leg parlay, buddy. I won't be doing this podcast anymore. No, I mean, it's going to be they're at 122 offensive rating or 119 offensive rating, I think, or something. I mean, it's up no, there with the best in the league. 122 since November 17th with the starting lineup and probably a little higher. I pencil in 120 for every Clippers, <laughs> like for every Clippers right. game now. But yeah, and like once the defensive side of the ball catches up a little bit you know because it's not like the defense is having to win them games right now it will in the playoffs at some point for sure but i i mean you're you're right man watching this team uh i people are talking about trades in these things but i'm just like there's not a top nine that's beating this team in seven games right now or a top eight like there, there's it doesn't feel like it as of February six five forty seven. It, it doesn't, but there's some we still have March. There for sure, there's but, oh, yeah. we know there's March, but that's why I time stamped it, Adam. That's why I hit him with the. the I, I just don't want to end well, up actually. being <laughs> prisoners of the moment too much here. As good as this team is playing right now, and I agree, they can still be much better, especially defensively. There's a lot of quality teams out there. I don't expect them to do that against Boston if they met in the NBA Finals. They didn't have Chris Stapps Porzingis still in that game. That is a completely different team when they do have him on the court. So I don't want to overstate or get AK. No, don't get cocky. Hit, they lose. I, <laughs> is that what I, I mean? just... I just want to pump the Jets a little bit. It we is still February. We, we can definitely so. be excited, but... Teams are going to be able to hang with them at times. Like, look at what Phoenix has been doing lately. They're starting to click in with their yep. big three. That changes things. I don't think the Denver Nuggets have played their basketball best basketball so far this season. So other teams, I think, can make some of the same arguments that the Clippers are. Um, now, do they look like the best team in the NBA right now? Of course they do. Do they, have, do they have a gear they can reach that nobody else can meet them at? Maybe. I think that's a possibility. I think it, there's definitely evidence for that where if they're at their A-plus game and some other team is at their top highest performance level, that the Clippers still are just more talented and better, and you can't hang with them because of how much potential uh, they have offensively and how much how potent they are. It's very real. It's very real. I'm excited. I was trying not to get super uh, – this Grammy trip changed – my mindset i think that's like will same right like six and one on this and it's like damn okay like this is all real to the nth degree like okay. we just keep being proven that they're caring about it what <laughs> happens if they come home and the pelicans are waiting and pissed off because they got blown out on their home court by the clippers and they run them and win by 20 would that change your mindset at all or would you still be like hey six and one on the road trip though if the process is good in that game it does not really change my mind. But if they're exhausted, oh. which we're going to talk about, they might just 
I, I think if they got blown out by like 20 plus points, that starts to become a full on like indictment on the defense and where it's been. <laughs> oh, um, it fair. hasn't been like, you know, like it, it hasn't, it hasn't been great, but I think if you're getting beat by 20 uh, by the Pelicans who, you know, solid team, but if, if you're giving up that much to the Pelicans, I'm, I've got concerns. I've got concerns at that point, unless it's one of those losses where you just can't make a bucket to save your life. And like, it's not sure. It, it's not for <clears throat> it's it's not them like losing one one twenty to one hundred or something. It's a lower scoring affair, mm, like the, like their last win. Are are we not as concerned about the defense because we saw when they circled a game against Boston what they could do defensively and just how good they could be? Is that kind of what we're holding on to a lot? And the zoo thing, right? For me, it's just the zoo thing. Zoo's out. He's he when he comes back. We're really going to see that. It might not be where we want it to be for, you know, like, you know, believing in the finals after March and stuff like that when Zoo comes back. Um, but it's going to look a lot better. And this is not a shot at Mason Plumlee. Him and Daniel Tice were phenomenal uh, in their roles, especially over this road trip. They, they don't go 6-1 and one without some of the just, you know, little things that those two guys did. But the team's different with Zoo's on the floor um, defensively. So that, for me, that's kind of where... It might be a bit of a security blanket, but that's kind of where I'm at. Because Zeus still does have to get ramped up a bit. That's fair. You also you also get glimpses, I feel like, every single game. And like, well, <clears throat> highlights don't tell the whole story, obviously, because it's a you know, it's not an individual thing. <clears throat> it comes down to team defense. Like when your top three guys are are expand expand expelling the effort that they are currently on the defensive end, I feel like that in that situation, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, despite even like this, this Hawks, this, this Hawks catastrophe. It's fiasco, a weird game in Atlanta. It. Playing the Hawks um, like shouldn't count for your defensive or offensive stats. And <laughs> like, it, hey, the Hawks coming into that game, their last four games, they were the second best offense. They really were playing great and feeling good about themselves. They hit 23s. The Clippers hit 21. The Clippers really took their best shot offensively. And to your point, you're right. When you think about it, not having a Vita Zubas for the last dozen games or so now, and they're still finding ways to win. Okay, we got to lean into offense more. We have to be even better in this area to make up for the loss of Big Zoo, who I do think is the fourth most important player on this team when it comes to most matchups in a seven game series because what he brings defensively and how he just changes the landscape in that end. Kind of going to the other side of it, what did we think of the small ball lineup during? Uh the Clippers road trip as a whole, obviously against Atlanta that that worked very well. Um, do we think we're going to see that in the playoffs or is that just uh we're down zoo thing? It was four hot, basically four Hoffer lineup. And then like Amir Terrence or norm, they ended up being a plus four in their time. It looked better than that yesterday. Uh, when they were getting stops, Russ has a block. Amir gets a layup on the other end. Russ had that really nice feed to Kawhi for that reverse layup in that ATO that our friend uh, Justin Wilson outlined on Twitter. Uh, I did see this earlier today from Joey Lynn as people were adding me to say, hey, Adam, you need to own this. Uh, he said in their last 10 games together, Kawhi, PG, James Harden, and Russell Westbrook, they have a plus 37.8 net rating, and the Clippers are shooting 65% from the field and 65% almost from deep in those minutes. I asked someone how many minutes it was, and they said 58. I haven't confirmed that. But there, there's definitely been progress. We've seen that for over the last couple of months since they went away from that in the starting lineup. But I think part of the reason that it was successful recently is because They've leaned more small ball, as you mentioned there, Chuck. And if you have those four next to Amir or next to Norman Powell, it works better because it's not two non-shooters on the court with Russ next to Avica Zubats or Mason Plumley. And I know he's been in there too a little bit, but I think it's because they're just spreading you out, playing extra small. We saw them almost come back against Minnesota doing that. So it is there's something to it for sure. Will are you on board with more small ball experiments, or do you think it was – just I mean, matchup ba match based, I, I, I agree with Adam's point. Like, really, you just have to have the most shooting on the floor. That's like the entirety of why the small ball concept was even invented. And so I, it, it definitely depends on the <laughs> it definitely depends on the guards uh, in, in the guards that are in that rotation and, and the shooters um, and obviously matchup driven. Although working against the Timberwolves, I feel like is a, 
is a pretty good sign of of some at least some versatility to it. Um, but it, it's just interesting because I feel like now the team is very guard defined, right? Um, I, I, obviously, your your two best players are wings, but the, the rest of the roster I, I feel like is is pretty guard heavy. And the previous iteration of this team, which is very wing heavy. Ty didn't seem to have a lot of interest in in going small. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm curious why the shift. Um, I would say but... this. No, I will. I would say this though. The type of guards they have are more capable of guarding up. Russ can guard up. Terrence Mann can guard up. Yeah. Reggie Jackson couldn't really do that. Luke Kennard couldn't really do that. Obviously, John Wall couldn't really do that. So they do have a little bit more versatility with some of these guys that even though they're slotted in as guards, like Russ has been playing the five in some of these small ball lineups, and it's been working against certain I'd, matchups. I'd also say a, like a huge change, and, and what I would imagine why Ty feels a little bit more comfortable with these lineups is we now have like the, the best facilitator point guard that we've ever had right so even those guys like i mean god i love nick batum i love his passing but like those those wing lineups they never had the guy that was like that guy offensively who could who could you could run the offense through so i think that that i think that that showed it's i mean it showed its limitations i feel at points um in in the previous iteration so i think having a, a playmaker who is like a true blue playmaker uh you know can be the the fulcrum of your offense i, I think that that changes uh I, or i would assume that that changes sort of the the machinations on that for Ty Lue. and you mentioned russ as the center adam that with james harden out there we've seen that back cut alley-oop how many times because they're sagging off russ and he's able to get bored so when we when we get good decision russ he is a phenomenal small ball center or i don't know if center is the right well, word people have been using lynch pin a bunt, but like just someone to kind of like cause chaos in the middle a la terrence sometimes um in, in other lineups even on that play the most recent one i think it's mostly been where they feign the pick and roll with james harden and daniel tice so they step up to guard tice thinking he's getting the ball and then russ comes running in from the far side corner catching the lob so I don't know how many of those have happened with the small ball without even Daniel Tice on the floor, who has been good for this team. But, you know, another part of it and why it's been more successful is just Kawhi defensively is better than ever with his backline defense. And he's guarding bigs, too, and holding his own against Jokic, Anthony Davis at times. Like, we've seen it over and over again. Uh, he's bigger and stronger than ever. Like that is the truth. Kawhi Leonard, you know, earlier today I saw, uh, or who had this, I think it was wind horse, Wendy. Uh, somebody brought up the fact that, oh, it was JJ Redick who wasn't giving him the credit for being in his top four, in the MVP conversation recently, but he did bring up this point that Kawhi Leonard, this is the best version of him since 2017. Now, I wouldn't go there because I think in the 2021 playoffs, like Kawhi Leonard, I would take it from there. It's the best since the 2021 playoffs because he was insane before the ACL injury. That first round series, only him and Shaq shooting over 60%, getting that many points, and Kawhi's doing it from 14 feet out. Shaq was doing it in the 2000 finals from four feet out. But movement-wise and, you know, his athleticism that's still there because it sounds like he's just pain-free now – that was something that came out in an Ohm article recently where he had been playing through pain a lot at times, and now he just feels more like himself. There is something to that, but that he's much bigger is my point than the 2017 version of Kawhi Leonard with the San Antonio Spurs. He has just gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger every year. Did you guys see the uh, on the Clippers official account with him giving his jersey to 2 Chains postgame? Uh-uh. Kawhi looked like bleeping Carl Weathers. <laughs> God rest his soul. R.I.P. Yeah. He I actually feel like he's leaner. Like Apollo. I, I think he's leaner than when I think he's leaner than when he came in last season. Because I, oh, I actually last think that, that was an issue. Sure. 
and he, and he and he talked about it too how he he got he got too big and maybe it was to overcompensate to to deal with some of that pain you know hoping that a, a little bit more structural integrity would relieve that but i i mean he admitted like he admitted to it it was the wrong move and right now i i agree i mean he definitely does look stronger he also looks so lean <laughs> like no yeah um, he's so shredded he like he's cut like he hardly has any body fat he had a freaking eight pack he looked like apollo when he <laughs> gave his jersey to two chains i i couldn't believe what i was should seeing. adam and i do another hour on this yeah let's talk let's yeah just, what, just this <laughs> just the <laughs> physique uh, men's fitness magazine get him on there uh that would be that would be such that would be really funny um all right before we get to this clippers pelicans preview adam you talked about a little bit up top the clippers are half game out of first place in the west the top four are separated by a half game which this this top four battle to end the season is going to be one for the ages um for as far it's as it's set though right i mean like i i don't really see our top four changing i i don't mean the the position with the job oh, the teams within themselves. the top four for sure because I, I think, think the these sun's, four yeah sun's these four are probably your top four right and there's i think number five is like five and a half games out or five games yeah. out yeah, it would be tough. The Suns it's, it's put the themselves Kings. in the it's hole. really close. The Kings yeah. currently, the Suns are in six. Yeah, the Kings are five and a half games back. It's really close, but I think you're right. I think this is kind of the top four. Um, and if you're unless somebody goes on a massive slide, I suppose. Right, but so if you look at Tankathon, where are you about to pick a team? It could happen. There's still enough time <laughs> yeah. left. We're talking thirty plus games left in the season. If somebody gets banged up. Maybe someone else has a march where they're playing 18 games. I'm not sure about that, but <laughs> it's probably not know. true. If they are happy on the pod, I'll, I'll sympathize with you. Um, <laughs> if you look at the strength of schedule, which this does only take into account kind of winning uh, the team's winning percentage. It doesn't take into account things like schedule or spaced out of games and how things like that. Um, for the top four, the Clippers have the hardest. They're eighth. And then the Timberwolves, Nuggets, and Thunder are at 16, 17, and 19. So they're all playing seemingly based on winning percentage below average teams. This was from Tankathon, um, and the Clippers are eighth. I'm and, and the Suns yeah. have the toughest schedule left. So, oh, there we go. Uh, that, that hurts them. Sacramento yeah. has the fifth toughest. So I think That's Will's right. It is pretty secure with these top four, barring a major injury, probably. But that, I feel a lot better about the rest of the schedule after seeing how committed this team is to the regular season. You know what I mean? Like, when we first see the schedule, you don't really know. We have the old idea of what the Clippers kind of were and how they approached the regular season. And now we have this brand new version where I'm like, I'm a lot less worried. I'm still not, you know, uh, still think about March every other hour as opposed to maybe every hour. But it's I have a little more belief now after the the play that they've shown. Yeah, you kind of know what to expect with this team, even within a game if they start slow. Like they did multiple times on this road trip, they were able to dig out of those holes, I think, against Detroit, against Miami, and both of those games. And you just expect them to make winning plays down the stretch. They look like a team that has forgotten how to lose when at times in this era uh, they forgot how to win late in ball games. I mean, nobody's had a better clutch time rating since them since november 17th when you look at net rating and clutch time they've been awesome and they just continue to come through coach lou's pushing all the right buttons i think most clippers fans right now you've never felt comp more confident as a clipper fan than you do right now with this team yeah well how you feeling you think they're gonna finish okay with the schedule well, it's going to change. Like, I mean, their strength of schedule, though, I would guess they'd be in the bottom, in, in the bottom 10, probably bottom five after the month of March. Um, yeah, that's a good call. I feel like this is, is, is kind of where you want to be, right? You get those sort of, well, I don't know. There'll I, be I like seven games be. left at that point. <laughs> <laughs> it can still it'll be, be easy. Yeah. yeah. And there'll be a tight game. Those will be, the, the standings <laughs> will be crazy. Um, all right, coming up, we're going to talk Clippers versus Pelicans. That is happening Wednesday night at CryptoCom Arena. Uh, but first, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, the ads have been out for some people. If you're watching, you probably got like a Pontiac ad or something uh, before the show started. I don't know. Um, so if Wait you're for next year. Wait for the new year, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Don't buy a car. You got about 330 some days before you should buy a car. <laughs> um, we're talking Clippers, Pels. The ads have been loud for some people. If that's been the case for you, go ahead and turn it down. 
We got ads coming up in three, two, one. Hey, what's going on? Welcome back into Clips and Dip. Uh, we just wrapped up on the Grammy road trip. Looking ahead to the Clippers back at home, taking on the Pelicans. Um, this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, Pels are coming off of a, a steamrolling win over the Raptors. I think Brandon Ingram had 40 points. Um, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. They're playing pretty good. They've won three of their last four, uh, which is not. Really I know, but it's been five and five last. It, it's 10, been the you know? Spurs. It's been yeah. it's been like this. It's been the Rockets, the Spurs. Uh, and the Raptors. So they yeah, lost the, to Boston, the Bucks, and the Thunder before that. So they went through. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the Clippers have clean injury report. Zoo's not on the injury report. PG's not on the injury report. Just Musa, which is unfortunate. We haven't really talked about that, but it sucks that he broke his hand like he did. Um, yeah, that's definitely one of the bigger talking points that we've glazed over this. Wait, is that, is that segment or coming up or yeah? Well, that's that's we're leaving that for March. We're gonna well, have very much we'll another segment on Kawhi's bod, and then maybe we can follow up with <laughs> yeah. the hot bod commercial. Yeah. Um, oh God. Adam talked about that uh blowout when we had uh against them about a month ago. Ingram shot horribly in that game. CJ was bad, Trey Murphy was bad. D Zoo's Defensively, the Clippers were good. Yeah, Zoo's back. Are we gonna see like why is we getting doubled? I imagine we throw Ingram those kind of goofy little double teams that we were shuffling uh, that last game. That was kind of a weird one, too, because that was Kawhi had an off game. Uh, Paul George had 20 plus points, and, and that was like a that was a, Ka a rough Kawhi one, which we are not accustomed to seeing really at all. Kai was under 50 percent. He was just seven of 15. How dare he? <laughs> what is he doing out there? Does <laughs> loser, he show up in big loser games? Numbers. Uh... <laughs> But yeah. that was that game too. We got a lot out of the role players. Like Terrence was great. Norm was great. Um, I, I, Mason just had garbage time. We won boards, which was really surprising in that one. But one thing I noticed when I was looking back in it, we lost the possession battle by ten field goal attempts. But that also could have been just because they were missing so much. I don't know. That was something that was kind of if the shooting splits would have been a little more in favor of the Pelicans. That is something that I'll be watching for in this game is how the Clippers take care of the ball and take advantage of their opportunities yeah they did have four more offensive rebounds and five less turnovers in the game leading to and that. zion left early right didn't he get he that's took, right he took that's a weird right. knock early maybe third quarter but at that time because of how dominant they were in that game on the road and i don't think anybody expected it because the pelicans had owned them and stuff that was the new oh this is the best victory of the season <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really impressive uh, the way the Clippers dismantled them. It was that second quarter where they went on, they won 30 to 15. They doubled them up in that second quarter. And really it was over going into the fourth. Uh, the score looks a lot closer than it actually was. 111 to 95 Clippers was the final. I don't think the there Pelicans. Was like eight, not, there was like eight minutes of garbage time in that one. And so. we're a bad garbage time team. It is really bad for the net rating for the Clippers for the garbage time. They're just trying to live up to the name of garbage time. That's what that's what it's about, right? Yeah. <laughs> it it happens to everybody, but they tend to be in these situations where you know when you're up by 25, and I think Kawhi is not played in like four or ten fourth quarters so far this season. Where the other team still has wow, some of their looking fourth quarters, their role players in, and the Clippers are throwing out, you know, guys who hardly get any run. Did Moon play in that game? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think Xavier Moon got any time in that one. Um, Bones did. Yeah, Bones. We're going to talk about the Bones Highland trade stuff that came out today, which I was kind of surprised by, just the the terms of it. Um, yeah, this was – remember we, we talked about that article by J Jackson Frank about the Clippers pick and roll, and he used this game as an example of how good it was because the Pels threw everybody at trying to figure it out, and they couldn't sag off Paul George. They couldn't – you know, and like Zubat's back is, is back again for this one. So Harden is going to be, you know, really in control of this game, um, and it's going to – I hope he's, you know, good at dictating early, as he has been. So I, I don't know why he wouldn't be, but they're still a good defensive team. I hope he's getting some cryotherapy after playing 80 minutes the last couple of games. No, it's so many. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know. And the double teaming uh, of Ingram will be interesting to watch. What did we think? I noticed this too. Some people were tweeting about this on the road trip. A lot of zone being thrown at the Clippers. 
over the last handful of games. It felt like there we saw more zone against the Clippers um, kind of in these hand like recently than before. And I'm wondering if the Pels will try and do anything like that because it does kind of mess with the rhythm early, at least. Well, yeah, I think my the idea. intention is to keep Kawhi off of his spots, really, like just eliminate yeah. some of those like, you know, 14 footers, like the, the stuff, um, you know, avoid them from getting to the rim and, and keep the guys out of the, the spots where they like to be productive. It makes well, sense. Oh, absolutely. I just feel like it, seeing it so much more, it's like, oh, this is how teams are trying to stop the best offense in the NBA right now. I think it's at their own peril or it eventually will be because you look at the first quarter against Miami and the Clippers were one for eight from the outside. They just couldn't hit shots. You want to bust the zone? Well, they have the best three-point shooting team in the league. The last three quarters of that game, they went 15 to 31. So <laughs> eventually, yeah, if you leave them open, you are going to pay for it. Uh, but I think it's good for them to get through like – Throw every defense you can at them during the regular season and build up those reps so the Clippers figure out exactly how to play against anything in the playoffs. Because you do see weird stuff like that in the playoffs. Like you're, we're going to see some really wonky zones <laughs> against the. And Clippers it's like the, the it's the same thing with doubling Kawhi. Like with the level of talent that that's on the floor for the Clippers, there's no way you should feel comfortable throwing a double ever. Like, and if you do, like, you should get punished on that every single time. There's just too much talent. There's just too much talent to throw a double at, at somebody. I'm trying to look up how many assists um, Kawhi had in that game because I can't remember if they were doubling him a bunch in that one. Um, Kawhi only had two assists. So I bet if they throw the doubles at him this time, he's going to be in the, you know, not incredibly much higher, but like the five or six range um, with how the team's shooting. I'm surprised at just how good the Pelicans really are this season. They've kind of flown under the radar a little bit, maybe this recent, because they had a nice run before going 5-5 five and five their last 10 games and losing to the upper echelon teams, but they have the sixth best, uh, or they have a top 10 net rating. Uh, they were the great league. last they're, they're year fifth. before the Zion injury. Yeah, I mean, when they're healthy, they've kind of had some of the same issues as the Clippers the past couple of seasons, but they're fifth in net rating on the season. So this is a very dangerous squad. Yeah, no one scored over 20 points for the Pels last time, which I would bet maybe changes. Um, yeah, Valid Valentinus was the highest scorer. <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, not They wreck them just doubling Brandon Ingram, like make him a passer. Can he do that? Is he there with his game yet? And that was something I think a lot of people wanted to see from them because he always seemed to light them up in first quarters, especially. For and sure. Coach Lou talked about that coming into the ball game, and they executed that game plan to perfection. I'm, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Clippers go as far as Paul George and Kawhi and James Harden are going to take them. But in this game, Will be interesting to see how Zoo's looking, movement wise, health wise, everything like that. Because even healthy last time, Valanciunas kind of did his thing a little bit on the boards. I think he grabbed eleven or something like that. So, this big is game for Zoo. Cover to return for, to. That's such an interesting cover for Zoo too. Like Valanciunas, I mean, he's hit how many threes against the Clippers? Like it's 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 interesting the way that he can stretch the floor and is still like very physical despite taking some knocks and being a little bit older. That's it's an interesting cover for Zoo. I think the they Pel both show up for it, too. You know what I mean? It feels like they both get up. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it sounded like post game after the Miami Heat game, uh, he only played 18 minutes, and Coach Lou said it or he said it, that the game just felt too fast. It still yeah. was moving too fast, which is amazing to me because I know he had missed a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks or whatever it was, but like sometimes, you know, it's the old cliche. We think of them as robots or these guys are professionals. It's like, no, that timing, those reps, the rhythm, all that matters because a guy who hardly misses any time ever in just two and a half weeks could completely felt like the game was moving too fast for him or feel like the game was moving too fast for him. This Pelicans team, by the way, they're the second best team. I don't know if it's shooting variance. I mean, we're pretty far into the season, but when it comes to three point shooting, they only teams are only shooting just over 34% against them from the outside. That is their defense. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, that shout out Norm. We're going to have Norm. Yeah, they shot, we shot 42% basically against them last time. So we wrecked that season average um, for the Pels. And we're going to need that again, right? We're going to need a similar. The blueprints there for the Clippers to beat them, right? Like you said, it's doubling Ingram and it's shooting around 38 to 42% from three. 
I think my favorite it's thing easy. on this. It's just like that. Like that. It's right there. I run the, the shoot 38% play. Every, I mean, most times down the I'm floor. spamming that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the favorite thing uh, to me on this road trip that I picked up on, though, was this Clippers team. You know, we talk about all the different ways they can beat you, but they really showed what they can do with points in the paint. It started with the Lakers game right before they left. But I think over the next three games, they were averaging something like 70 points in the paint. So they brought it with them on the road. And that's just a different wrinkle from this Clippers team that. You know, that was an area of concern really in the 2 one era. They don't get enough easy buckets. They don't get into the paint quite enough. And then on the road trip, you started to see, oh, they didn't shoot well from three throughout a lot of the road trip, and it didn't matter at all. <laughs> yeah, this is – I wish they weren't playing them coming back from this road trip, but it is a nice test of what the team's going to look like after a seven-game road trip and a really good opponent. Did uh, you hear Coach Lou post game? He was like, that's not right that we have to play a day after <laughs> it's we come not. back on this road trip Has and we get Mark's one day off. Has he seen March's schedule? He's trying to live in the moment like Kawhi. <laughs> he, can't, he can't do that right now. Yeah, one of the, the tell-all books. He'd hit, he'd hit you with the, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I've seen <laughs> yeah. that. Well, oh. It's March. Um, I'm not going anywhere. Um, who is your player of the game pick for this one? I, can we uh, – question for player of the game – should we not say Kawhi because we know that he's going to be dominant or is he still an available player of the game pick for us? Do you I want him think. to play poorly? Yes, that's what I'm it's saying. A simple question. Like <laughs> <laughs> Were you a member <laughs> of the Kawhi plays poorly party? Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, if you want to pick Kawhi, go for it. It's just a very – You're just a casual. <laughs> With, with a you're K. a casual. You're a casual if Kawhi's not MVP. You're a casual if you pick him yeah. to be player of the game. There's no winning. There's no Guys, winning for casual. I really That's feel important. like putting that pressure on the media. Where if you don't have Kawhi in the upper echelon of MVP candidates, then you're a casual. I really think that came into effect over the last week. I think it's sure. been it's been huge. Yeah. But that, yeah, Zach put, Lowe's heard that. He was like, "Oh, okay. I got to talk about Kawhi Leonard here." Yeah. Uh, Will, who's your pick for player of the game? Who may or may not include Kawhi Leonard? Uh, I'm going to go Norm. Yeah, Norm is coming off of a, a great addition to the road trip. I think he's going to be in tempo. Um, and, yeah, we, we talked about offensively. If they can mitigate the one of the things the Pelicans do really great on the defensive end, I think that that um, makes a win all the easier. I, I hope that we get some some garbage time in this one like we did last time we played the Pels in Smoothie King Arena, which is my my favorite arena name. I th like what you said about tempo because it sucks they have to play the next day, but the tempo is going to be there for the shooters, right? Like it's not like that thing or maybe a, a, some rust after a couple days rest. But yeah, Adam, who's your pick for player of the game? I'm going to go with Russ. I thought oh. I, I may be misremembering, but I thought he was really good in that second quarter in New Orleans when they pulled away. And that was part of the reason why, because the pace he was playing at. Uh, but when you talk about guys having low energy or just not being reacclimated, being back home yet, and they only have one day off, you might need Russell Westbrook and uh, what he brings to the table in a game like this. That's a yeah, I like that's a good call. Um, yeah, I wonder if we'll go small against him because that would be if Russ is playing well, he would be a nightmare um, against that Pels team um, as a center right there. I am going to go with Kawhi Leonard. I think he's going to play great in this game. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, um, I think Paul George, uh, and even a more niche pick, I think Paul George is going to have a bounce back shooting. I think we're going to see over 20 points, Paul George. Um, he's not going to spill anyone's drink with a pass or anything like that. Uh, we're going to see, yeah, we're going to see 20 point Paul George. It's going to be great. That's a good call. I like that. Hell I yeah. wish I did it. Well, hey, it was either that or Kawhi. So I was between the some people are casuals, Adam. You know, it's not your fault. <laughs> look, I, if it wasn't for casuals, then I wouldn't look so smart, right? <laughs> oh, wow. Well said. Uh, oh, <laughs> speaking of casuals, there was really, I don't usually uh, read the live comments, but someone referred to us as bandwagon fans, which I thought was the funniest thing in the world. On the YouTube or on? On the YouTube. I thought it was really funny. I was like, yeah. You know, or, do you guys do you guys call I it the YouTube? <laughs> yeah, I call it the YouTube. <laughs> On the, the Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> what else is it? Mario. 
uh youtube <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah the youtube um all right come are you watching mario on the youtube <laughs> that's all my right. voice yeah so i'm saying to my nephews when i go visit uh you, you buddy remember, playing remember back when we we didn't cover this team until they went on this run where they've won yeah. 31 to 39 yeah, hey, we yeah, brought Rod crazy. on the pod, bro. Um, Fairweather so. fans, yeah, we brought the biggest Clippers hater in the world on the pod. How's that for <laughs> Fairweather? Um, all right, coming up, we're talking the Clippers trade rumors, um, a, and then a friendly reminder to get your bets in order, and then a friendly PSA. Uh, but for those of you who have been listening to this on the audio, we appreciate you. The ads have been loud. Um, ads are coming up in three, two, one. Welcome back in. It's Clips of Dip, episode 49 of season two. I'm Adam Moslem. We got Chuck Mockler and Will Updike. If you missed it, we did a little C&D uh, clips and C&D double dip last night on Clippers Talk. Chuck came on the show. It was a great time after the Clippers went six and one on their road trip. But now after previewing the Pelicans game, we got to talk about some random stuff, some rando <laughs> because, uh, I don't know. There's this thing called the trade deadline coming up on Thursday. Kind of a big deal. But I didn't see this. Did this come out earlier today from Ohm? And this quote from PJ Tucker, Chuck, give us some context to this. When was it said? I thought, <laughs> I feel like I'm on trial uh, tonight. Uh, this, was, this was a couple days ago. Um, it was a report that PJ Tucker is actively looking to get traded. Ohm uh, was on a podcast. Uh, and he said, I'm not saying they're going to make a massive move, but they did just get a Vita Zubats against, back against Miami. And so now they have three bigs. And of course, they do have PJ Tucker, who wants to be traded, has made no secret about that. He even told me that just last week in Toronto, I think his words were actively looking to get traded. So I'm imagining PJ from, oh, on the phone, PJ. like two yes. executives, like, guys, please, come on, please. <laughs> Hello. Um, I... Let's make this happen. I'm just like, so he's like, I don't know if he's like, like he's going to give money out of his own pocket to the team that he goes to or something. I don't think he's like leaking this. Cause I don't know if, if it's a leak. If you just directly tell a reporter you want to be traded, I feel like it's bigger than a leak. Um, but like what, what's the move here? Uh, Get him off the if, team. Like if the right trade is there and it, trade. Yeah, I, I'm sure they'll figure out a way to uh, accommodate P.J. Tucker, <laughs> who hasn't played since, I don't know, uh, November at this point. I don't think yeah. he's played in December. Uh, I, I'm i I'm still happy with the fact that even though he has made these comments to the media here and there, there isn't a disgruntled guy when you look at him on the bench. There isn't a guy who isn't still involved, cheering guys on and being a good teammate and a good vet out there. I've seen him multiple times when Terrence He's Mann was going through his struggles. He came to the bench after turning down a couple of three-pointers. I forget what game it was. Coach Lou pulled him. He goes to the bench. It was like in the midst of the deepest part of the funk that he was in. <laughs> and you could see P.J. Tucker was trying to console him, put his arm around him, was trying to tell him some positive stuff to keep his confidence up. So I'm appreciative for that. All right. That's fair. And I still think if he did stay on this team – he has utility in a playoff series. Uh, he doesn't have it in the regular season, so I'm not sure how he'd have it when it matters more. He can guard Jokic, guys. He can guard Zion Williamson. Maybe we'll see him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be. Are you oh, here's where I, the game. player to watch. Player of the game, PJ Tucker. You asked me where I would lose faith if they play PJ Tucker tomorrow. Is where I lose faith. In the, well, in when the they game. go on a 10-0 run with him, you won't. <laughs> Well, he's not going to be part of any of the field goal attempts, so maybe that would happen. Um, Bone also, cool, he should just waive his. The, he should like opt out of his. He shouldn't have opted out into his second year. That's why he's still on this team. Probably would be my yeah, guess. Yeah, I I don't think he's willing to waive the second year. Yeah, um, is that and, something you can do at this point? Would it have to? No, be? I don't know. Like that's what I'm saying. Like, just like a handshake agreement or a verbal that hey, I'm I going think, to waive yeah, this. I think, I, yeah, I think it would have to just be a, a an unsaid. Instead of an IOU, it's a you there don't know There is an me. unspoken message here. It's F you. <laughs> Lebowski. The more, I guess, pertinent, important news was that uh, Bones' fate 
Uh, sounds like the Wolves and Hornets would offer two second round picks for Bones. Which I would not want to see him on the Wolves in the playoffs. That was my uh, first thought, or next year, or anything like. He's locked in for like no money the next two years. It's like two point four this year and like four next year. Two seconds. I guess I don't know what the value was, but I hope he goes to a place he plays that's not the Timberwolves. Yeah, I mean the guys on the come. Yeah. Well, he. What are you? <laughs> I don't think two seconds is enough. I like. Look, I I know that he's not in the rotation right now, and I I might be abnormally high on bones given what we saw at the at the start of the season. High on bones again, man. Season. It's, it's um, the new gas and glue. Yeah, are you are you huffing bones? But the again? thing, <laughs> the th- like the thing to me, um, the bones are also my dollars. But uh, <laughs> the thing to me is, you need talent that's that's locked up at a, at a low price range, and do you think? With one of those seconds, or ideally both of them, you're gonna get you're getting a better player than Bones. Because I think the way this team is playing right now, look, unless you were like the per like the sort of the prototypical six eight wing that the Clippers are looking for, I don't see a lot of time for young guys or developmental guys or project guys. So I just I think I'd rather have the asset than Two second round, pick. like something tan, the, like something tangible, rather than two seconds. I guess. Yeah, it's I guess we would replenish the seconds that we lost, but they, I, I don't know. They gave up two seconds for him, right? I agree with you. Like, yeah, are you yeah. going to find a guy with either of those seconds that has the upside that Bones has shown in limited time with this team? But he has shown it again. That game three where the Clippers got screwed against the Phoenix Suns, he had a three rim in and out after I think he had twenty points maybe all in the second half of that game, he was electric. Uh, and then the start to this season, as Will mentioned, he looked good. He had, I think, a 17-point game, an 18-point game, and everybody talked about him in training camp and just the difference in him, uh, even coming off last season with the Clippers and how the progress he had made. Kawhi Leonard was taking him under his wing. Obviously, I don't want to see Bones leave, especially if he goes to a team like Minnesota. That would be rough. But... And the right move, it it may have to happen. I don't know. It may be the big sweetener. What about three second? In a, in a different move for sure. I like the second rounders to, just doesn't really move the needle to me. And we talked about players being great on the bench despite their playing time. I can't name like Bones is the it, is the top of the line for that. And he kind of man like he thought in training camp, like he thought coming into the season, he was going to be the guard. <laughs> like uh, maybe the, you know, like maybe the six man guard, but like he thought he was going to be playing a significant position. And um, it's, you know, he's now just so did I. like racking up. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's just, just uh, racking up C and D. So I don't know. Yeah. It's tough. Uh, it feels like, yeah, maybe trade him for a package deal. Cause everyone was like, Oh, bones for sec- two seconds. That's pretty cheap that the Clippers got him for like, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. It would just, and I would feel bad for bones. It's weird. I don't want him to go to the Timberwolves cause they're in the Western conference and I don't want him to go to the Hornets because they're so bad, <laughs> but he would get playing yeah. time, you know? Yeah. I think backing up LaMelo. I, I guess lamelo has been hurt often. Uh, he, he will shine somewhere when he gets playing time. It is going yeah. to happen. It feels like a given with Bones. I want to see it happen with the Clippers, but this is the balance you are trying to have when you're a championship contender, but also a team that is lacking first-round picks moving forward where you want to hold on to guys that have youth and potential and are on cheap contracts as Will was laying out. It's kind of what the Golden State Warriors, you know, the back end of a dynasty, things usually don't end pretty. And they're kind of dealing with that this season. And now all of a sudden, finally, Kaminga is getting some run and showing what he's been able to do. But it's a hard thing to balance. And I think that's where the Clippers are at. They're in a tough spot. Tough spot. Hope Bones goes to the best place possible for him. Um, Something that we've been talking about on this pod that we're going to talk about one more time and probably again. Get your MVP bets in for Kawhi. Do it. It's not as good of a bet as it was yesterday. They're going How up. about that? One down. day, one day went from plus 10,000 to what? Plus 5,500. 
Yes, it is at plus 5,500. Um, Stats Williams put out this tweet today. In the past 30 games, Kawhi Leonard has a 25-5 and record while averaging 26.4 points per game, 57% from the field, 51% from three, and 92% from free throw. He's the first player to average 25 points on 55-50, 90 shooting splits over any 30-game span ever. I figured. <laughs> I mean, the only other guys I was thinking, okay, maybe Steph had done it. Maybe KD had done it. Maybe Jokic had done it. But I don't yeah. think the three-point shooting, I don't know if he had that long of a stretch where it was ever that high in his MVP seasons. Those are the only guys. It's insane, which is why it is so perplexing and downright frustrating that he hasn't gotten the love that he has deserved because it's not going to last forever. So how about we celebrate it while it's going on? Because if they're not paying attention to it now, then if he goes on a cold streak in the next couple of weeks or misses some games in March, it's totally going to be forgotten. So that's why I felt like there should be a sense of urgency with talking about Kawhi for MVP and hashtag claw for MVP. And I'm always adding people. And uh, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to say who it was, but somebody was like, can you stop? One of the reporters that I was adding said, can you stop adding me on these? And it had only been like three so far. But because so many people like them and retweet them, all that those notifications pop up for him. It's like, I mean, I'll stop, but can you talk about Kawhi Leonard being this damn good? I mean, <laughs> you're doxing people for Kawhi's MVP. <laughs> Not doxing anything. What are you talking about? I'm atting them on. <laughs> Tell us who it was. I think that's us, pretty far off from that. Tell us who it was after this, because I, I think I have a guess. But okay. I don't know. I'll tell you afterwards. Um, and then final PSA, put Norm in the three-point contest. Yeah. Just do it. He wants to do it. And he'd win. I don't know. Is the three-point contest more exciting than the dunk contest at this point? Yes. Did you see the contestants for the dunk contest? Last couple no. of years, it definitely has been. This year, hold on. Let me look at it, because I think Woj tweeted it out. Uh, this year... It's like Obi Toppin's brother, it, Mac McClung, <laughs> Jalen Brown. Obi Toppin? It's Jacob Toppin, Mac McClung, uh, Jaime Jaquez, and Jalen Brown. I didn't know Jalen Brown's doing it. I still yeah. don't think Hawkes has bounced like that to be in no. a. Uh, I saw him at UCLA a lot. I'm a little bit surprised by that selection. <laughs> I just think they just want really good to do there. I just think they want anyone to do it. Mac McClung will probably win again. Yeah, well, they're pulling guys, guys out of the G League. <laughs> yeah. I wish they'd just get, grab the best dunkers in the world from Team Flight and have them put on a show because it will be more spectacular and you'll actually see new stuff you've never seen before, at least at that level. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And one mixtape tour had it, right? I think you're <laughs> right, Will. A three-point contest and maybe the skills. Skills is cool. Three point is definitely overshadowed ever since the Zach Levine, Aaron Gordon dunk contest, which was amazing. That was the last really great dunk contest and the best of all time, I think. So yeah. I don't know. Since then, it's like, how, how do you top it? There was a time where they went away from the dunk contest for a couple of years in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, I think they should do it again and switch it out for one on one. Whew. Guys won't do it. They they talked about it. They had the game of horse that one time with Kevin Durant. And that was I forget bad. who else was out there. They did it outdoors. It was bad. But guys, they won't do it because of endorsements and if they lose. And yeah, I mean, it's the reason I think LeBron James never did the dunk contest. And yeah, I mean, LeBron not doing the dunk it's, contest. I'm like, it's everything to lose, not much to gain. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of these guys. It's not like the '90s where it's yeah, like um, that was a major driver for you. Um, but yeah, get Norm in that three-point contest. Um, I think can they? Is it I, like a reserve thing? Like somebody drops out and he's in, or can they add a guy? <laughs> maybe. It's like when you work at a restaurant, and if you don't have a clean enough uniform, they'll just switch someone else out. There's people who wait <laughs> to maybe pick up a shift. Um, all right, I think we're pretty much wrapped up on this episode. Adam, is there going to be a double dip after the Pels game tomorrow? Yeah. Just not with you guys. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Who's coming with wow. me, baby? Who's I coming think, with me? I believe it's Will's turn. Um, oh, what happens if they lose, though? Is Will still coming on? 
And I guess probably not. That. Probably, probably not. not. Busy signal. Ironclad um, contract. <laughs> and then maybe another press box live. I don't know. That could be fun, depending if something crazy. Oh, happens. that was fun. That was a good time. Wait, are you guys gonna be there? Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dope. Let's yeah. take a picture. Let's take yeah. out. Um, <laughs> uh, let's not go to the game, dude. Um, Peter, you said we were gonna be friends. <laughs> And then we're going to do a tripod for you on Thursday. And then since it's a brunch paddle on Saturday, we'll be doing a live YouTube hang afterwards. Because what else would you want to watch the day before the Super Bowl than the Clippers play the Pistons at 1230 in the afternoon? Uh, well, review. That's one of those matinee starts that you're okay with. <laughs> yeah. Um, Will, where can these people review and maybe subscribe to us? Uh, you can rate or review this podcast over on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can listen to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Amazon Music, uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Deezer. But if you really want to get the full clips and dip experience, you got to head over to YouTube.com. Not the YouTube, YouTube. just YouTube.com. Uh, and that's at Clippers Podcast. And, you know, you can only leave one rating or review over on, over on Spotify and, and Apple Podcasts, which you should do. But you could comment on every single episode over on YouTube <laughs> if you felt so inclined. Yeah, I think there's only like 89 videos up. It wouldn't take too long. Um, Adam, it's a rainy week in LA. People might be feeling a little bit down, even though the Clippers are playing so well. What's one positive thing you want to give the Clippers fans before we send them into this night? I actually thought the last episode of True Detective was pretty decent after a really mediocre season so far. Oh, uh, well, there's the only two more, so they got a <laughs> lot of shit they got to get. Really? Through. It's only six? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's been rough since season one, man. Uh, you know what? I think the Clippers are going to get some type of hero's welcome tomorrow night because everyone has bought into how good this team is. They've missed them. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and it is going to be loud at Crypto.com. And therefore, that home court advantage, where they have been really good so far this season, at home, it's going to come into effect against the Pelicans. They may get ambushed. The Crypticom Arena is going to be rocking tomorrow per Adam Oslin. That's going to be a good time. Uh, we'll talk to everyone after the double dip. We'll see you a couple times later this week. And as always, let's go Clips. <laughs>